A continuación, una presentación muy, muy, muy esperada por todos y cada uno de nosotros, incluyendo a mí y a Jorge y a todo el equipo que está trabajando detrás del Blockchain Summit Latam. Conoceremos las principales ideas detrás de unos libros académicos más importantes en torno a Bitcoin y cómo con, confluye con la economía. Para dar cuenta de esto, tenemos en este gran escenario virtual la presencia de Seifedín Amos, autor del libro de Bitcoin Estándar o El Patrón Bitcoin en Español, traducido ya más a 15 idiomas este libro académico. Y con quien eh, mantuve también una conversación en el podcast del Blockchain Summit Latam, que pueden escuchar como un complemento a esta presentación que va a dar. Les vamos a compartir también el link de, ese, de esa entrevista en el podcast a continuación en el chat de eh, Brela. Esta charla, como igual la anterior, va a ser llevada en inglés, pero tenemos a nuestro traductor, Juan Ibarra, que nos está apoyando con el texto en español. Sin más que agregar, dejo en este escenario a Seifedin. Seifedin, welcome to this virtual stage. Uh, it's entirely yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure uh, to be giving this presentation after uh, everything that uh, the world has gone through over the last few months, and I would have absolutely loved to have uh, done it in person in Panama. Um, and hopefully next year, maybe, or sometime soon. Um, so in my presentation today, I'm going to go over some of the main concepts that I discuss in my book. What is Bitcoin? How is Bitcoin unique as a form of money? What is Bitcoin good for? And what are some of the implications of having hard money in society and what uh, Bitcoin makes possible? So um, in, in my mind, what Bitcoin is, I, this is my definition of Bitcoin, is that it's a peer-to-peer -peer software for operating a payment network with its own native currency that is protected from unexpected inflation without having to rely on any trusted third parties. So you can make payments online without having to go through somebody and with a currency that is protected from inflation. For me, the really two most important properties of Bitcoin are number one, it is the hardest money that has ever been discovered or invented. And two, it is the only working alternative to central banks for international payment settlement. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these two um, points about Bitcoin. To begin with, we begin with the issue of hardness. Um, what gets used as money, if you study monetary history and in the first few chapters of my book, we see that basically what gets, what ends up getting used as money is always something that is hard to make. Because if something is easy to make, then if you use it as money, others are going to start making more and more of it and then they will bring the price down. So anytime you stay, store your wealth in something that is easy to make, it's easy for others to suck that wealth away by printing more of it. And so the only things that end up working well as money are things that hold on to their value because they are hard to make. So if we look at examples of money, we see that there are always things that are not easy to make, that are always hard. So cattle, limestone, seashells, glass beads, precious metals, and so on. They're always hard to make. And in terms of, you know, even within government money, we see that the forms of government money that are very easy to make, like, say, the Venezuelan Bolivar or generally Latin American currencies uh, in general, as I'm sure most of you know, they're easy to make. And so they end up uh, uh, losing their monetary status quickly and they get replaced and they get thrown away. And people prefer to use harder currencies that are harder to make, like they do the dollar. Um, cigarettes in prison are another example. All of them are hard to make. And gold was always the money uh, all over the world by the end of the 19th century because it is the one commodity that has the lowest steady supply growth rate. It's always growing at around 1% to 2% per year. And that's what we see here. The supply is always growing like this. So if things can't grow at a very fast rate, and here we see the percentage supply growth rate is always 1% to 2% for uh, gold. If things can't grow at a very fast rate, then it serves as a good monetary medium. And so this is why Bitcoin matters, because Bitcoin is... Um, it's, it's not just that it is a form of money that is hard to make. It's unique because its supply simply cannot be increased beyond the uh, already scheduled supply. So there's no way to make more Bitcoin beyond what uh, is already scheduled, which is really unique because it means that with uh, it, it makes Bitcoin different from every other form of money because with every other form of money, as we see here on the right, if you... If you use that money as a store of value, the price of the money rises, 
people will mine more of it they will make more of it whatever that form of money is they will find more of it and they will bring it onto the market if it's government money they will find a way of printing more money if it's gold they will keep mining for more gold and that leads to the supply increasing and that in turn leads to the price dropping the price of the commodity will drop so there's this negative feedback uh, loop in all forms of money wherein if the price goes up people will make more and then the price drops a little bit but bitcoin is different from all these other monies because there is no way of making more there is no way of making more bitcoin in response to increased demand so if there's increased demand the price rises mining bitcoin becomes more profitable but it, there's no increase in the supply as in the blue box with the other forms of money mining bitcoin becomes more profitable so more hash power goes to mining bitcoin because of the difficulty adjustment that makes the bitcoin network harder to attack and that makes bitcoin survive for a longer time and that in turn increases the store of value demand uh, for bitcoin so all of these things continue all, all of this pattern continues to repeat itself in, in, in a cycle and in my mind this is the only way that we can really understand why bitcoin's price acts the way that it does uh, because it's been 11 years the supply can never respond to increases in demand and so what ends up happening is because the increase in demand causes bitcoin to become more secure and it causes the price to rise it leads to an increase in the uh, demand even further and that's i think what makes bitcoin so interesting and why uh, its price continues to go up like nothing we have ever seen before if you look at the last 10 years bitcoin has basically gone up about 1 billion percent well now today it's around one and a half billion percent in about 10 years we've never had anything grow this fast anywhere ever and i think the only way to understand that is because of bitcoin's difficulty adjustment because of the fact that bitcoin mining always increases the difficulty of mining rather than increasing the output of mining and that's what i like to call bitcoin's number go up technology it's really the the, the real uh, killer app behind bitcoin the, the the most important technology behind it because nothing else has this property nothing nothing else is able to use this technology so difficulty adjustment in bitcoin protects the network from inflation it ensures that the supply is auditable and verifiable by all network members. It converts people's inevitable incentive to increase Bitcoin's supply into network security. So difficulty adjustment just makes Bitcoin more secure. And that's why I like to call Bitcoin an all-conquering juggernaut of economic incentives. It's just a monster that is constantly eating the world because there's no way to stop it by making more of it. So the price continues to rise and that gives everybody more of an incentive to use it more. Whereas all other monies are being inflated, Bitcoin continues to just operate as normal. And instead of uh, the, the supply of Bitcoin rising, as I said, the difficulty adjustment causes the, uh, causes the uh, processing power behind Bitcoin to rise, making Bitcoin more secure. And that's why the processing power behind Bitcoin is 100 exa hashes. Well, now it's more than that. Uh, this is a little bit old, this presentation. I can, I, it's, it's very hard making this presentation because the Bitcoin hash rate continues to go up and I can't keep up. But some rough order of scale is that Bitcoin's processing power is about 10 trillion times as much as your laptop. So there are 10 trillion laptops of yours that are out there um, making uh, Bitcoin transactions happen. The same transactions can be done on a single computer, but Bitcoin does it without having to rely on anyone or anything. It doesn't. It does it as a, a as a neutral protocol, and that's I think what makes it so incredibly powerful. So it has no single point of failure. There's no single piece of critical hardware or infrastructure. There's no single critical individual or organization. Bitcoin basically can't be stopped. It's a protocol that is always open to anyone who wants it. Every ten minutes, a new block is released. And it's never confirmed a fraudulent transaction so far, which is quite incredible if you think about it. Because this means that the hardest money ever invented is now available worldwide for anyone who can receive two megabytes of data every 10 minutes. It's purely voluntary. It does not need regulation, enforcement, or police. It's chosen and valued freely on the market. It's sound money. And that's the definition in the Austrian school for what is sound money. Sound money is whatever form of money is uh, chosen on the market because people... Um, choose it not because they have to because not because anybody puts a gun to their head and tells them to use it 
um, it's the first strictly scarce asset. And that's why, you know, when we think about the uses of Bitcoin, for me, the most important uh, function of Bitcoin is that it is a store of value because it is the first thing that is truly scarce. It's the first, it's the first uh, asset that we have that is um, whose supply cannot be increased uh, indefinitely. With everything else, the limit on every other thing in the world is human time. The only other thing that we have that is scarce is human time because everything else, you can always make more of it if you have more time. Um, people think that gold is scarce, but really gold is not that scarce because we can give up, um, if we give up other... Um, if we give up other goods and services, we can always dedicate more people toward mining gold and then we dig deeper and we find more gold. The size of the earth is enormous compared to how few areas we have dug in. And the quantity of gold that is available is not limited by how much there is in earth. It's limited by how much time we have to go and dig up for, dig for gold. And that's true for all resources except for human time which is the one thing that we can't just indefinitely make more of we can't replace we can't keep digging deeper and finding more time and it's true for um bitcoin as well and that's why i think bitcoin works as the best store of value because it's uh you know if you want to choose something as a store of value ideally you want it to be something that nobody can inflate that nobody can make more of and uh because the more they make more of it the more they devalue the part of it that you have and so uh, bitcoin doesn't have that inf imperfection its supply is just continuously fixed and so for the first time you can store the value produced from your scarce time in a store of value that is also scarce so you can't make more time for yourself and you can't make more bitcoin so i think this is a natural match between the two that's why i like to call bitcoin is the most advanced technology for tr transferring the value of time into the future the second important use for Bitcoin, in my mind, is that it is a decentralized free market alternative to central banking. If Bitcoin continues to not die, demand for Bitcoin will basically rise. And if it continues to rise and more people want to use it, um, I think it's not really uh, something that is uh, can remain niche. I think Bitcoin will, will have to grow more because... Um, you simply can't isolate yourself from the consequences of people using money that is harder than yours. And I discuss these examples in uh, my book. In a sense, um, since you know this is a Latin American summit, I'll give you a good example uh, from um, any Latin American country which has its currency getting destroyed now. If the people of that currency decide that they don't want to use the dollar and they want to stick to their currency and they all agree to each other and promise that they're not going to use it, that's not going to save the currency. Nothing is going to be able to save the currency. Um, you know, the harder money is always going to win. And the easier money, because you're printing more of it, it's going to just continue to lose its value. So even if everybody wants to continue to hold it, even if everybody starts acting against their interest, eventually the supply continues to increase and the value will have to continue to decline. Whereas the people who hold the harder money will just witness the value of their money increase over time, whereas the value of the easy money decreases. So... In that sense, we may be seeing something like this with Bitcoin. And I explain in my book, in my book, I don't think Bitcoin is a payment network and I don't think Bitcoin competes with uh, consumer payment uh, solutions. It's, Bitcoin is not PayPal. It doesn't compete with PayPal. And Bitcoin's on-chain transaction cannot possibly scale to handle individual consumer payments on-chain. Um, I think the demand for hard money is going to be much hard, much higher than the demand for on-chain transactions. And therefore, I think in the long run, what we're seeing is that Bitcoin scales off-chain. And we're seeing transactions happening on second layer. And we'll see the base layer for Bitcoin continue to remain as a um, settlement layer, more, more, more similar to a settlement layer. Um, and this is what we see happening now as Bitcoin transaction costs are beginning to rise. Um, so we're seeing effectively a new global settlement system beginning to develop on top of uh, Bitcoin. And uh, that's, you know, um, also other reasons why I don't see Bitcoin being a consumer technology is that, you know, the transactions need several minutes to clear, uh, whereas Bitcoin's transactions provide finality of settlement in under an hour. So it won't scale for mass payments, but it will scale as a base layer, I think, uh, similar to what happened with the gold standard. So 
this I think is extremely powerful. What are the implications if we live in a world in which everybody in the world is able to get themselves uh, hard money and everybody's able to use hard money? I think the implications would be enormous. Um, the first one, first one I like to talk about a lot is the issue of time preference. In specific, uh, specifically, you can think of time preference as how much you value the future versus the present. People who have a high time preference discount the future a lot so they don't think about the future they're more concerned about the present people who have a low time preference are concerned about the present uh, but are still concerned about the future and they try and keep it in mind and in my mind i think the more that we find in uh, money is losing its value the more people are forced to think about the present and the less they are able to plan for the future if money is expected to appreciate you have less uncertainty about the future. You can store your wealth in things that are, um, that you can, that you, you have a store of wealth that you can maintain for the future so that it reduces your uncertainty about the future. And um, that I think in, is massively important in how people decide to behave, whether people become um, in thinking about the short term or the long term, whether people focus on saving or be, whether people focus on spending in their life. So easy money, money that increases its supply very quickly, um, is associated, it also comes with artificially low interest rates. So it gives everybody an incentive to borrow more and to save less. And that, I think, is a product of easy money. Easy money gives us time preference. Hard money, on the other hand, does the opposite. Hard money gives you the incentive to save. Saving allows you to accumulate capital. Capital allows you to increase your productivity, and that leads to better material living standards. So for me, if we move towards a harder money, we would witness the world become uh, more concerned with saving and less concerned with consumption. And we see this as we moved over easy money in the last 50 years, you see that Western European countries had their saving rates decline. And here, of course, some Keynesian economists will tell you, well, but what if, um, what if, uh, if we have a hard money, then people won't spend. If you think that things are going to get cheaper next year, then why would you buy anything this year? And of course, this, I think, makes no sense. Um, time preference is always positive. People always prefer today to tomorrow. And so... Uh, you still prefer to have something today than to have it tomorrow. If you expect your money to gain value over time, you're more likely to hold on to your money than spend it on something. But it doesn't mean that you won't be spending. And my favorite example for illustrating this is looking at a 10 megabyte hard drive from 1980, which cost $3,500. Today, you can get a one gigabyte hard drive for $30 or something like that. So... Uh, the, the one gigabyte is many uh, thousands of multiples uh, of 10 megabyte. Um, no, wait, mega and then giga, so it's 100 multiples. It's 100 times bigger, and it's 1% uh, cheaper. Uh, if I'm running the numbers correctly, I may be wrong. But it's, a, it's, it's 100 times bigger, and it's a, it has 100 times more data, and it's cheaper. So why would anybody buy that hard drive in 1980? Why would you buy 10 megabyte hard drive in 1980 when you can just wait 40 years and buy a hard drive that is 100 times larger for 1% of the price? And the answer is time preference. Time preference is positive. You prefer to have the hard drive today. The person who bought this in 1980 was not concerned about whether they can get it for a cheaper price in 2020. They needed it in 1980. And so they would, yeah. Oh, yes, sorry. And so they needed it in 1980, and they needed it because it was valuable for them in 1980. That's what they care about. So a hard money will cause people to spend less frivolously, but they will still spend. You still need to survive. You still need to eat. You still need to live in a home. And so um, it would lower time preference, and I think this would be reflected in much more provision for the future and much more concern for um, the future and much less... Um, present orientedness and high time preference. And I think this would be reflected in all manners of issues. For instance, and, and in my book, I make a lot of comparison with the gold standard era. Under the gold standard, we had hard money and we had the most incredible innovations in the world happen. And we had steady economic growth and we had low, def low inflation or, or no inflation, a very little in price inflation and very little, uh, well, very little uh, supply inflation of gold and probably no price inflation. And we had all these incredible inventions happening. 
And you had, on eras of hard money, you had incredible art happening. Whereas today, if you look at art today, it's a bunch of worthless scribbling. Uh, think about the Sistine Chapel. You know, why is it that people don't make Sistine Chapels today? And why do they make these things that we see here in this painting? Why doesn't this guy who made this, why can't he make that? Wouldn't you say this kind of looks nicer? Well, because this one requires people to be thinking about the future. It required Michelangelo four years of hanging from a ceiling and getting sick in order to complete this. And that kind of dedication to long-term projects and the financier, the people who financed him, who wanted this to remain and to remain beautiful for hundreds of years, that's something that you see only in eras in which people have hard money. That's when you start seeing so much more uh, future-oriented art. And then you look at the 20th century, you see it's basically disposable art. It's like a McDonald's meal. You know, you, it's made to be thrown away. Um, you, you know, 500 years from now, the Sistine Chapel will still be there. 500 years from now, this toilet paper will be uh, probably gone and forgotten. Um, so time preference for me is a very important factor. And I think hard money would make uh, time preference much, um, much lower. Capital, um, uh, now politically, uh, I think what Bitcoin means is that we have uh, capital becoming more physical, uh, more information rather than physical. And so I expect to see more political exit uh, rather than voice. People can just take their money and leave. And I think governments uh, are going to have a little bit of trouble with that because it's much harder for governments to inflate the money supply and it's much harder for governments to track money down with a world like Bitcoin. So it makes things harder for governments and better for people. So that's good if you ask me. Um, I think um, the absence of inflation makes the nanny state and the managerial state very difficult. The inability to finance the government with printing money makes uh, these things much harder. Beyond that, I think, you know, we'd see a move toward a world that becomes more like Switzerland. Switzerland is the country with the um, classic liberal... It, it was Switzerland is the country that remained on the gold standard the latest, and that's why you can see that it is maybe the, one of the freest markets in the world, because by remaining on the gold standard means that the government cannot spend a lot and it cannot um, finance itself. And so the government remains limited. So I think you'd see more and more of the world grow in that direction where government loses its importance and um, private associations uh, replace it. Um, effectively, and then in terms of economics, I'm just skipping over this stuff briefly, but uh, you can see more detail about it in my book. Um, Hard money is the solution to the business cycle. Easy money is, uh, and, and effectively easy money that the government can manipulate, easy credit money that the government can uh, create and uh, out of thin air, is the reason why you get business cycles. Central planning always fails, and easy money and interest rate manipulation are just an example of uh, central planning in the credit markets. And so you see, if you look at Switzerland, the 19, uh, up until the 1970s, when Switzerland was still on the gold standard, we see that the inflation rate there was uh, practically, uh, sorry, the unemployment rate there was practically zero. It rarely ever moved away from zero. And the same was the case with uh, inflation, of course, there was really no inflation back then in Switzerland there because they were pegged to gold. And then after the 1970s, after they removed the peg to gold, they start witnessing uh, more and more unemployment. And in the 1990s, they um, joined the IMF. And so their unemployment went up even much, much more. And now they're becoming just like any other Keynesian economy where there is always unemployment and people think this is normal. But it was not normal. In the 1970s, this did not exist in Switzerland because they had hard money. So I think Bitcoin is the solution to that. And Bitcoin ends the problem of global barter, the problem of having to have all of these different currencies across national borders, which is, I think, ridiculous. And it's massively inefficient. You know, the whole point of money is that it reduces economic friction and um, international differences, uh, international currencies just increase those frictions. Uh, frictions. And um, effectively, uh, Bitcoin is just politically neutral, censorship-free settlement. It separates politicians' morality from people's money. It's automated monetary policy. It's a free market in money, savings, capital, and investments. And finally, there's a massive uh, impact, I think, for Bitcoin on energy markets. This is a little bit um, different. But basically, Bitcoin is uh, 
creates a liquid market in electricity because anybody can sell electricity anywhere in the world with Bitcoin because all you need to do is just connect your miners, your electricity to Bitcoin miners and then have them sell the Bitcoin mining hashes to the Bitcoin network and you're able to monetize your electricity, which is absolutely incredible if you think about the implications of it. Um, so yes, so this is it. Thank you very much for hosting me. My book is now available in 23 languages and you can see more of my work on my website, safeadeen.com, where you can find my courses and research. And you can also sign up to my email, uh, mailing list to stay updated, safeadeen.com slash email. Thank you very much.